My name is Suhail Sayed, and I represent the Indian American Muslim Council uh, from the DC chapter. Religious freedom of millions of minorities in India, and most notably the Christians and Muslims in India, are being violated on a daily basis. And the problem is made worse by the total impunity that these perpetrators of religious violence enjoy across India. And this is because they have the backing of an organization named RSS, with, which is the mothership, the motherboard of BJP, the Bharatiya Jan Janata Party, the party of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, yeah, my name is Greg Mitchell, and I'm the managing co-chair of the International Religious Freedom Roundtable. Uh, happy that we're having this event here today, and I look forward to future events focused on religious freedom in India. Uh, because it, it's, there's definitely a, a situation there that, that we need to uh, to discuss and come up with, with solutions and, and, and then have us civil society organizations like the ones here working in partnership and in coordination with the U.S. government uh, and, and working in coordination as part of this global alliance that's building as a result of the annual ministerial to advance religious freedom. So with, these discussions like the one we're having today are all within that framework of increasing attention to the need to, to build religious freedom and, and how religious pluralism actually helps to bring stability uh, to read countries and regions and bring st to bring security and to, to open the door to economic development, economic growth, peace and prosperity. And that's what this is all about. You know, so I'm happy to be here again moderating today. Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to be with all of you today. I'm actually relieved and delighted that I'm here because I woke up early this morning to catch a flight down and um, as occasionally happens and it seems to happen more at this time of year there were canceled flights and then canceled cars down to Boston for alternate flights and other flights so I was sort of um, you know crossing my fingers and uh, and hoping for the best but here I am and I'm delighted to be here India's constitution provides for freedom of conscience and it protects the right of all individuals to freely profess, practice, and propagate their religion. Furthermore, it mandates a secular state. It requires the state to treat all religions impartially. And it prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion. So far, so good. The Constitution also says that citizens must practice their faith in a manner that does not adversely affect public order, morality, and health. Fair enough. Although the breadth of this particular carve-out certainly raises some potential concerns, the fact is that we all know that no rights, even the most fundamental ones, are absolute. And so this provision of the Constitution shouldn't necessarily be unduly alarming. In addition to the strong and seemingly clear provisions in India's constitution, echoed in other provisions of federal law, um, there have also been seemingly strong affirmative statements about religious freedom from India's top leadership, including this quote from Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who said not too long ago, and I quote, so far as the government is concerned, there is only one holy book, which is the constitution of India. The government will not tolerate nor accept any discrimination based on caste, creed, or religion. Once again, we could say that this sounds quite encouraging. The American statesman Adlai Stevenson used to say that solutions begin by telling the truth. And the truth is that for more than a decade, religious freedom has been in serious decline in India. And this worrisome trend has been accelerating in recent years. One prominent and alarming example of religious intolerance in India has been the rise of what are sometimes called cow protection vigilante groups. These vigilante groups of fundamentalist Hindus routinely take the law into their own hands to publicly attack and in too many cases murder individuals whom they suspect of slaughtering cows. This lethal harassment is not only directed towards those suspected, almost always falsely, of killing cows, but also towards mere dairy farmers, 
towards those involved simply in the leather goods business. You know, we could, I could give all kinds of statistics, and I'm sure we will, but I thought, you know, given the brief amount of time, that it'd be best for the audience to hear from one of the persecuted. So we don't have anyone here, but I have a letter from a pastor, and I, I thought I'd read it. So this is uh, Pastor Radhe Shyam. Uh, I'll just read it. For nearly 20 years, I've shared the gospel and established house churches in and around Sultanpur, Uttar Pradesh. Although there have always been opposition from local people, things have become increasingly difficult in the recent past. Anti-Christian sentiment is spreading throughout Uttar Pradesh. We used to hear about other churches being closed down and pastors being jailed, but now it's our turn. As Christians, we can no longer gather together in Sultanpur. I've stopped conducting worship services, and I only pray and counsel other Christians over the phone. Recently, I was in jail for a week, along with three other Christians. The crime, in quotes, we committed was praying in a Christian home in Chopra Village. Around 35 Christians had gathered in the home uh, on November 14th, 2018. We were about to conclude the prayer meeting when suddenly a mob of 25 people shouting loud anti-Christian slogans surrounded the house. I was so terrified, they shouted, where is the Christian monk, Baba? We want to kill him. One of our group went outside, and he was merciless, mercilessly beaten and injured. I stayed inside the house, and after an hour, the police came and took four of us to the police station. They put us in lockup for the whole night. The next day, they sent us to jail. We were falsely charged for insulting Hindu gods and goddesses under sections 153A and 295A of the Penal Code. A week later, last Tuesday, November 20th, we were released on bail. Things have become nearly impossible for pastors to lead worship services, not just in my area, but all across the country. We hear about attacks on Christians, Christians being beaten up, pastors being intimidated or jailed on an almost daily basis. There seems to be no religious freedom, although India's constitution guarantees it. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Anderson Rajarigam. I'm a pastor at uh, a Lutheran church in Drexel Hill. I am here representing the voices of millions of my Dalit sisters, daughters, mothers. For a lot of you, the term Dalit itself might be new. It has just come to replace whom we have called untouchables, outcasts for centuries and millennia together. I deem it a great privilege to be here just to be the voice of those who have not had a face, no voice, and no life whatsoever. If you refer to the Indian Constitution as the holy book, uh, as quoting Narendra Modi, we certainly would be able to call it unholy because we as a people have been treated as completely outside the society. We are the outcasts. So what does the question of religion, uh, how does the question of religion come into play at all? The Dalit woman in the Indian society is, uh, bears the brunt of triple oppression. One, as a woman within the home, as a Christian woman, because uh, Christians are a minority, and then as a Dalit woman. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start off by thanking the organizers of this event who have given me the time to speak my mind. It's not that Christians are killed. It's not that Muslims are killed. It's not that Sikhs are killed. It's not that moderate Hindus are killed. Tamils are getting killed. Kashmiris are getting killed. Gorkhas are getting killed. Assamese are getting killed. But what is the root cause? And as the young lady who gave the presentation at the beginning said, if you can look at the problem and find that there is a fundamental error, point to it. And that fundamental error is Brahmanism, mm -hmm. which has the fascist ideology that somehow a small group of people are born superior to others. And that is the root cause of our problem. That thinking, that ideology needs to be checked and it needs to be kept at bay. We have mentioned all the problems. You know, we can literally fill this room with the amount of literature if we were just to record the atrocities that have been committed by the Brahminical forces. There's the curtain of democracy that they use, and then they go on with their business of killing individuals who are of the dissenting opinion, or just because you do not like them. You do not like the way they're born into a different family. With that being said, 
one of the biggest problems with, within that ideology, the Brahminical system, is RSS. It is a shell organization. They do not have any bank accounts. They do not have any names of their members. They are run by tentacles, such as the RSS, HSS, Bajrang Dal, um, HAF. All these people just got together and they have formed these pseudo institutions that are a threat to our freedom. It's not just India's problem anymore. In September, there was an event that got held at Chicago, Illinois, under the banner of World Hindu Congress. And that is what gives me shivers. We have these right-wing saffron terrorists roaming in the free world, threatening our free institutions. And what is of utmost shame, I will not mince my words, because truth needs to be said and heard. It is an act of shame when American elected politician, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, goes and shares the stage with Mohan Bhagwat, who should be tried for crimes against humanity. And it was, what is even more shameful is that he got elected on a progressive agenda. He belongs to the Democrat Party. That is very upsetting. These people are wearing facades while they carry big knives to kill us, to kill the dissenting opinion, to kill anybody and everybody who will speak for equality, for justice, and freedom for all.